<laughs> oh, thank you, Pastor Daynard. Um, man, appreciate you guys uh, so much, and let me be a part of this series. Pastor Daynard's right. Um, it's, it's easy to get up and preach on things that people enjoy hearing you preach on, right? It's easy to get up and preach on things where, uh, you know, like, I mean, the concept of grace. Don't we all love the concept of grace? Second chances, third chances, fourth chances. I mean, like, it's easy to, you know, illuminate those aspects of Scripture and, and get people to get excited and amen. Um, the hard part is talking about things that, like Pastor Daner said, step on people's toes and really disrupt uh, ideologies and disrupt thought patterns and disrupt worldviews, disrupt patterns, disrupt idols. Um, and and that's, that's the hard part. And so, you know, I'll be honest with you, I've wrestled with this message this whole week because um, I have very dear friends on either side of the conversation. And, and I love them dearly um, on both sides. But what, what I just, as I, as I leaned into it this week, I felt like the Lord was just saying, you just need to be true to God's word and allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak through God's word. And um, the hard part about this, this topic, we're going to talk about sexual identity. And uh, this is going to feel probably a little bit like a two-part kind of message because Pastor, Pastor Daniel is going to be talking about sex and, and uh, scripture. And, and you can't really talk about sexual identity without talking about sex. Um, some of you are really excited about talking about sex the next couple of weeks. <laughs> some of you are really nervous. <laughs> uh, but I do want to point you to some resources first because I don't feel like that I, I, I'm the authority on this topic. In fact, it's one of the things we're going to talk about today is who really is the authority on this topic. Come on. And, um, but I do have some friends who, who th- they, they have a lot more credibility to be able to talk about this. I told Pastor Daner he needs to bring one of my friends in um, next time you guys talk about this. His name is Christopher Yuan. He's got an unbelievable story. But I would love for you guys to go and listen to his conversa- the conversation I had with him on our podcast, the Nothing Is Wasted podcast, where he shares his story. So if you're interested in doing that and then exploring more resources on this topic, I want you to do this. Take out your phones. I want you to text a number if you're interested in these resources and just kind of dive in deeper because the challenge here is to take 40 to 45 minutes and talk about a topic that has so much nuance, Okay. And that's, that's going to be virtually impossible for us. So I'd love for you to dig in deeper. And so text uh, the, the word identity to 66866. What's going to happen is it's going to send you a text back to prompt for your email address and your name. And then we'll email you several resources from my friend Christopher. Um, unbelievable apologetic, uh, unbelievable theologian, teacher, Bible teacher. And, um, and he's got an unbelievable story that gives him a lot of credibility to talk on this topic. Of sexual identity, so I want to I want to point you in his direction. Uh, you guys got that? You you're going going there. I'll give you a second to do that. It's up there, so you guys can do that as as we're talking. But um, yeah, we're going to talk about sex over the next couple of weeks. And some of you might be surprised that we would talk about this in church. But I just happen to believe that if uh, if culture is talking about it, if media is talking about it, if our entertainment's talking about it, if our school systems are talking about it. Why shouldn't the church talk about it? Because I don't know if you know this, but we serve the God who invented it. Did you know that? Do you know that this was not concocted by some man? Right? This was not a, a thing that man de- derived and said, you know what, this would be a good idea. This is actually God created sex. He didn't catch Adam and Eve in the garden. You get that? You know what I mean? In fact, he creates man, he creates woman, and and I I just have to imagine, I kind of see scripture play out in different ways, that when he brings woman to man, you know, God uh, God told Adam to name things, name animals, and he gave him the the, the responsibility to name Eve, right? And he named her what? Woman. I happen to believe it's because at first when he saw her, he was like, whoa, Man, and then that was further confirmed when God said, well, let me tell you a few things right here and just kind of whispered in Adam's ear and he goes, whoa, man, right? Like, I'm just, listen, I'm I'm telling you right now that God created this. And unfortunately, uh, this world led by our enemy has perverted this. Because you know that, that Satan, our enemy, cannot create anything. You realize this, right? He is incapable of creation. 
In fact, the, the only beings that, and, and part of God's creation that he created that co-creates with God is human beings. We are called to be co-creators with God. And so he gave us that task. The enemy takes what God creates and he perverts it. And so, and, and so because of this, our world has perverted this concept of sex. And so now, I don't know about you, but I kind of grew up hearing, whether it was in church or whether it's in Christian circles, like sex is dirty, disgusting, nasty, and gross. Save it for the one you love. <laughs> what? So it created a lot of confusion for me. And, and, and not very many people in Christian circles were talking about it. My parents hesitated to talk to me about it, you know, as, as, as communicative as we were. I'll never forget that when my, my parents found out that at school they were going to be doing the sex talk with us, it was in fifth grade. Uh, by the way, it's happening way earlier yeah. now. Yeah. And so you better believe we need to, especially as parents, as, as, as people who, a church community, a church family, we need to be having right and true conversations with our kids a lot earlier on because you don't want them hearing about this from their peers, right? And so, so they, they, my parents found out that we were having the sex conversation and they sent a letter home saying that we were having this conversation and, and they were gonna split out the guys and the girls and it's fifth grade, they were gonna talk to the girls about you know, how their bodies were going to be changing and the boys about how their bodies were going to be changing. And, and so they, we, we were two separate classrooms. Well, they forgot to send my parents' communication that they lost the video or misplaced the video for the boys. So we, they showed us a bike safety video instead. <laughs> they just kind of covered it up, showed us a bike safety video. And so we didn't understand why it was so necessary they split off boys and girls for this. The girls come out of their video and they're like near the headlights, right? They're like, and the boys, we're coming out like, ah, you know, and I go home and my, they didn't tell the parents, they didn't communicate to them that they had, you know, misplaced this video. So I sit down with my mom, my mom's like, so how was it? What, what, you know, what'd you learn? And I'm like, I mean, I don't know. I, I learned that you should never ride alone and always wear protection. <laughs> This is why we need to talk about these things, Pastor Daner. <laughs> because particularly around this subject, <laughs> miscommunication and misunderstanding can be a very, very tricky thing, can't it? And so if we're going to talk about this topic, we have to go back to, I believe, the origins of all of this. We have to go back to the way God originally intended and designed all of this to work, right? Because again, he's the inventor of all of this. He's the creator of all of this. And if I'm going to consult somebody about something, maybe my iPhone or some other contraption that I want to use, I would much rather consult the inventor who designed it to function a certain way because if I don't operate it the way it was designed to function, it will malfunction. And unfortunately, friends, unfortunately, so many of us have been caught up in the flow and the stream of culture when it comes to sex, and we're experiencing the malfunction of all of it. And I don't say this for any kind of like shame or any kind of like, because here's the deal. I understand. I get it. We're all in the same boat when it comes to this. Every single one of us have fallen into sin and shame when it comes to sexual nature. And so I don't want to, I'm not preaching at you. What I, what I want to bring to you today is I want to bring to you this concept of what would it look like for us to walk in and operate in the flow of how God designed us to work and experience the fullness of those things. Because what the enemy wants to do, I'm going to draw a couple things up here. The enemy wants us to either see sex as something uh, that, 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 is, um, that is God or that is gross. You see, see, God created it and called it what? Good. Everything he created except for, except for mankind, he called it good. He called mankind very good. And so God, God calls sex good, but the enemy wants to distort it into two different sectors. It's either gross, which is what many of us grew up thinking, and then we had trouble understanding how it was good, or it's God, which seems to be the way that our culture is going right now. 
And, and the difference between good and God, this, by the way, doesn't have to do with just sex. This is literally everything in our lives that is a created thing. Scripture says that we as mankind tend, have this tendency to swap worship of the creator for the created things. And so, so the difference between what God created is good, there's so many things that God created is good, and us perverting that and calling it God is one letter, and we'll call this our awe, right? Our awe. In other words, our awe, our, our worship, our focus, our attention, our affections. When, when, our, when this is misplaced, friends, it takes what God created as good and turns it to God. And this can be so tricky and deceptive in so many areas of our life. And what can end up happening is we, we, we displace God sitting on the throne of our lives with a created thing sitting on the throne of our lives. And then that begins to inform, listen to me, who we are. Our identity is derived from who we place on the throne of our life. You hear, you hear me? And so what has happened with this conversation of sexual identity is that we have reduced one component of our identity. Did God create us as sexual beings? Yes. You, you get that, right? Like, like that is a component, an aspect of our identity. But we have taken that aspect and we have reduced our entire identity down to one aspect. You hear me? So we have, we have now squeezed out the fullness of how God created us, the Imago Dei, the image of God inside of us, because God says, I want to create you as a whole person, but now we are disintegrated people because we are now defining ourselves purely by our sexuality. Do, do you hear me? And so we've taken what we've been given, the what, and we've turned it into who. Because we've now displaced God at the throne of our lives, who is the, the ultimate authority around who we are, and we've said, okay, no, no, this thing defines who I am. This created thing defines who I am. You see where we're going? So, so I, I, I identify as, and you can kind of fill in the blank. And it's all because we've now usurped God as sitting on the throne. And we've begun to, to take this concept of truth, and, we, and, and we've reduced it down to your experience. You hear me? So, so, so we say things, listen to the subtleties in culture. We'll say things like, well, well, that's your truth. And this is just my truth. What you mean by that is you mean that's your experience. And this is my experience. And your experience, listen to me, friends, your experience is valid, okay? It's, it's, it's valid. You did experience that. But your experience is not the same thing as truth. Because if your experience is the same thing as truth, my experience can be completely different and our truths are different. And the problem with our truths being different is that our truths can't be different. You hear me? Let me give you an example. Just really, just like some etymology right here. What are you sitting in right now? A chair. I don't know. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a horse. It's got four legs on the ground. You're sitting in it. Everybody from here on out, these are horses. We are now going to take part volunteering. They're going to clean the carpet. We're going to all get the horses up and we're going to stack them over here to the side. Now, if we communicate like that, friends, we all begin to have this understand. We're like, wait a minute, what? Everybody's confused. Why? Because at some point, there was a standard around the language created for this object right here being called a chair. Who established that? Probably the inventor of the chair. They invented something and they said, this is gonna be called a chair. They brought it to market. Everybody said, you're right, that's a chair. And they agreed upon this standard for that word. Truth is a standard that cannot be shaken. Your truth, my truth, is not truth, it's experience. Yes. And so the truth, the standard of truth is, is defined by who? Who defines it? 
Do you define it? Do I define it? Does the government define it? Listen to me. Does the church define it? No. So I'm going to tell you, you're going to go across town and you're going to find churches that say different things about different issues. You're, you're going to hear in a lot of other Christian, you're going to hear some very compelling arguments for a different gospel. Paul had to warn people of this. The church in Galatia starts out with, wait a minute, you believe the true gospel. And, and, and now what happened? Yes, who bewitched you? Who tricked you? Who, who, who convinced you to believe something different? Well, some very slick, persuasive, compelling language that if you don't understand the truth of God's word, scripture, yes. and its context, then you can easily be deceived. Yes. Yes. And so, so, so who sets the standard for these things? God, simply, has to set the standard for these things. And we see a picture of the standard for all things, not just sex. We see a picture of the standard of God in the first two chapters of the Bible, in Genesis. In fact, it's interesting. This, these are the only two chapters that we see the perfect standard and picture of God's wholeness and perfection of what he intended this world to look like. Like, it didn't take long for us as humans to mess this thing up. Right? Two chapters. And then we, and then we totally mess it up. Listen to me. Don't blame Adam and Eve, because what we're going to talk about today is that every single one of us has innately inside of us this thing that wants to replace God on the throne of our lives. So if Adam, had, if Adam hadn't messed it up, I'd have messed it up. You'd have messed it up. Why? Because we're not God. So we can't create the standard for this. So I want to dive into Genesis chapter 2. And I want to show you something that says this, and we're going to kind of, or I'm sorry, Genesis chapter three, and we're going to dialogue about this because this is the first chapter that we see God's perfection begin to go awry. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. The serpent was more crafty and deceptive than any of the other animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? Okay. Okay. A couple problems with that. First of all, Eve talked to a snake. Right. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> right? <laughs> so we're like, well, there's, there's some good snakes, Dave. You know, a good snake is a dead snake. <laughs> Eliminate the problem from the beginning, kill the snake. Okay, that's it, right? <laughs> so that's the first problem. The second problem is this. The serpent, the snake says, did God really say? Friends, this is where it starts. It starts where the, the enemy will, in a crafty, slick way, begin to get us to question the word of God. And question God's, God's standard or his desire for all of us. God doesn't really, listen, <laughs> he doesn't really want you to experience, like, he doesn't want, he's holding out on you. He, he, he actually wants something from you, not for you. So, you know, God has desires for us, right? Did you know this? His desire is for us to operate and live in freedom. In fact, the very first thing he said to man and woman, he said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. I think we miss that sometimes, that God's first words to man and woman are, you are free free. I have created you free. I don't want you to be in bondage. I don't want you to be in slavery. I don't want you to be held down. I don't want you to be bound by anything else that this world might put on you. I, don't, I want you to be uninhibited, unencumbered, free. And yet the freedom comes with some parameters. Because no freedom, listen, no freedom comes completely unencumbered. Do you hear me? You can't have freedom without having some kind of parameters. Parameter sets the guard for freedom. It's like my kids. Yesterday, we had our, our Sabbath, and I, like, I, I was just like, you guys just do whatever you want. I walked through my house 10 minutes later. It was in absolute chaos. 
and they were miserable. They had the worst attitudes ever. And I'm like, what are you doing, right? And they're like, it's like, the, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And they're just getting everything out, throwing everything. At one point I walked up to my youngest son. He had a diaper that was ripped up, right? Not a dirty diaper, thank the Lord. A clean diaper that was shredded. There was white everywhere. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm like, I just want you guys to be free, okay? But I'm gonna have to put some guardrails here on this freedom for you in order for you not to just lose your ever-loving mind, <laughs> right? This is true. The problem is, is we focus on too much what we don't have, what it seems like God is withholding from us rather than what he's given us. You see, he's given you purpose. He's given you life. He's given you abundance. He's given you fulfillment. He's given you wholeness. He's given you salvation. He's given you grace. He's given you freedom. He's given you a family. He's given you belonging. He's given, listen, all these things, and yet we focus on, well, I don't know. I think he's holding out on me. And this is the trick that the enemy is trying to deploy into our lives. Did God really say? Did he really say that? See, what he told them is he said, you are free to eat from any of the trees in this garden, but you can't eat from this one. Well, what do humans do? Wait, which one did you say? <laughs> and, and then it gets a little bit trickier, right? Now, let me, let me, let me when we dive in, I, I want to dive into some things because if God created the standard for sex, I want to just define what that is, Okay. And, and I want to be very, um, I want to be very conscientious right here. To uh, I want you to stay with me for a second, okay? Because what, what before I line this up, I want everybody to understand we we all fall outside of this. Amen. Scripture says we all fall short of the glory of God, right? We have all sinned, okay? So, but I but I need you to know, like this is God's standard. This is not Davy's standard. This is not Pastor Daner's standard. This is not the church. This is God's standard. If you read throughout Scripture, if you understand the fullness of Scripture, right? Then, then this is God's standard. And I'm gonna put it in the box right here, okay? This is where we are free, all right? Here's our boundaries, you ready? One man, one woman for life. One, one man, one woman. Okay, now here's the deal. If you want to get even further, if you want this to be like catchy so you can remember it, okay, I want you to think about it this way. One man, one wife for life. It rhymes, okay? Here's what this means. Here's what this means. S sex, marriage, those things were meant for by God's standard. One lifetime monogamous relationship with someone of the opposite gender, okay? Amen. All right. Um, th this, is the, this, is, this is the playground, okay? This is the fence line. This is where, and within this, you are free. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Lots of amens going on right here. <laughs> Praise God. Outside of this, listen to me, outside of this, you are not a bad person. You are, not, you are not unwelcome. You are not that you don't belong. You are outside of the fullness of what God desires for you. And there's so many different nuances that we can talk about in this, okay? We, we, can, talk about, we can talk about divorce, okay? I would venture to say divorce has touched nearly everybody in this room, Amen. okay? And unfortunately, the church has told you, you know, God hates divorce, and they've twisted that to where it's been a very condemning thing to, to, to tell you over the years that God hates you or that you cannot be used. I can't tell you how many conversations that I have had. I just had a, conver a con conversation on our podcast. I don't know if you know the Christian artist uh, Blanca. You guys know Blanca? Just had a conversation with her. We're releasing it in September where she talks very openly and candidly about the shame that she experience, experiences right now and the questions and doubt of can God actually use me because she's just recently got a divorce. This is real-time conversation. 
Because this is what the enemy wants to do is to play on this idea and this notion that as, as we step out of God's boundaries, now he's gonna cloak us with this shame and condemnation that says God could never use you, yeah. okay? Um, my, my wife right now, Christy, she went through a very, very difficult, painful divorce. And the predominant thing that she said is, I didn't wanna to go to church because I didn't want the scarlet A on my forehead. Walking in, dropping my daughter off as a single mom. And I, and I wanted to serve in the back recesses of the church because I didn't think God could use me. Can I tell you something? <laughs> this does not disqualify you from God using you. Okay? Um, we can talk about this. We can talk about pornography. Okay? It's not hurting anybody. Oh, it's hurting a lot of people. Amen. Listen to me. It's hurting you. It is eroding your, the, the imago Dei, the, the sexual being that God created you to be. It's eroding that away from you. Okay? It's affecting your sex life. It's affecting your marriage. It's affecting your future marriage. Okay? It is destroying you. It is, listen, it is destroying, the industry is destroying Mostly, not all, but mostly women by objectifying them and causing this subtle worldview to slip into the minds of mostly men. This is not just a man-woman thing, right? It's across the board. But mostly men who would say that women are an object to be used and dispensed at my desire. It's a road, it is, it is destroying things. Listen to me, there's probably not anybody in this room that hasn't been touched by this that hasn't wrestled with addiction, that hasn't been exposed to it, okay? So I'm not preaching, listen, I, I have, okay? This is a wrestling for every one of us. So, so I'm not preaching at you, I'm saying this right here destroys us, okay? And we've got to understand this is outside of the bounds of what God has, the fullness, the satisfaction that he has for our sex life, all right? But this doesn't disqualify you. This doesn't steal your salvation. You, like, there's no addiction that can steal from you what only God can give you. How, however, this will rob you of your joy and your effectiveness. Because most of the time you're living this du duplicitous life where you're showing up and you're trying to minister out of the overflow, but this is eroding your soul. You hear me? Um, we can go outside in so many different ways. Homosexuality. We even, we even have to go a little bit further than this um, because there's multiple nuances within homosexuality. There's like the, you know, all the way from the spectrum, it's a, it's a continuum, all the way from the spectrum of just, you know, this license, freedom, multiple partners, uh, and kind of the, the stigma that is homosexuality a lot of times, all the way to just same-sex attraction, right? Same-sex attraction, okay? We're going to come back to this in just a second because it really is something that we've got to focus on today. Um, but we, we can also, uh, we, can, we can go through a number of different things right here when it comes to... Um, stepping outside of the bounds and the parameters that God has for us when it comes to sex, okay? But let's keep reading through Genesis and let's kind of see what happens right here. And I, I don't want it to just be in the context of sex. I want it to be in the context of God's desire for us and then the desires warring within us, okay? It says, it says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Is that true? Did he say that? Yeah, that's what he said. Watch this. And you must not touch it or you will die. Did, did, did he say that? He said you must not touch it. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. She added that to God's word. You see, just as dangerous as, as not believing or holding or revering God's word or questioning God's word is adding to God's word. 
Because what ends up happening, and when you add to God's word and you create a culture of adding to God's word and creating all of these different laws and rules that say, this is what you should follow, yet God didn't say that, right? Is that we begin to fall into the legalistic society that begins to whitewash all of our outward behavior while on the inside, our bones, our soul are rotting. And it doesn't give us a culture where it's, 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 it's good for us to come and confess because it's not acceptable. Do you know how many, listen, do you know how many pastor friends I have who have had moral failures in this nature right here, around this topic right here, sex, because it was not safe for them to come and confess because of the cultures that have been created around all of this because of legalism, okay? I'm just being real right now. So we can't, we can't add to God's word and, we, and, and questioning God's word is gonna, gonna be a, a slippery slope. So, so we've got to, what's God say about this? And it says, he says this, Satan says, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. You won't die. Let me ask you a question. Did anybody on the way to church today, you stop at Starbucks, do you run into Eve in the line? No? Why? She died. And, and listen to me, friends. Sin, when it entered the world through this moment right here, it leads to death. Scripture tells us there is a way that seems right to man. But in the end, that way leads to death. You see, sin, listen, sin might look alluring. It might look enticing. That's the way it's set up to look. My grandma used to say, you don't want to sin. Sin's not fun. I'm like, grandma, you're not doing it right. It is fun. Stepping outside of God's ways, doing my own thing, calling the shots, this is fun. Scripture says it is. That sin is pleasurable for a season. But ultimately, it leads to destruction. And the way that Satan has set up this persuasion is he's going to entice you with it, promise you something. When you slip into it, he'll condemn you for it. I can't believe you would. Right? Oh, you know it's true. You know it's true. Man, that, man late at night, you look at that pornography, it looks so enticing. There's so many desires that are drawing you to that. The moment you do, shame. This is the work of the enemy. I, we need to see this tactic right here, guys. This is slipping into so many of our gender conversations as well. Shame leads us into questioning, did God create me as a man? Did God create me as a woman? I mean, that's usually not even the language. Am I really? Because I'm identifying right now as something different. There's a different desire inside of me. And, and, so, and, and so, so then... Now, so early on, there is an encouragement for, for a transition to take place. And if you read the statistics on young people who have taken that transition, it is staggering the amount of anxiety, depression, and suicide that's associated with it. Because transitioning is not going to make you happy. It doesn't make you step into who God created you to be. It, 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 in fact, it, it wars against that even more. And so the only, listen, the only way, the only way for us to find the fullness, the integration of how God created us to be is to align ourselves with his ways. Okay. All right. So we got to, you got to keep, you got to keep listening faster because we got a little bit more to go here. It says in verse five, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Do you see the enticement here? You're going to be like God. You're going to be able to call the shots here. I know you've been really, it's been, I know that you think God's holding out on you right now, and he is. And you can be like God if you just kind of, just, just move in this direction here. It says in verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were opened. They realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Why did they sew fig leaves together and cover themselves? Shame. So prior to this, it's, Scripture says they were naked and felt no shame. Now they realize they're naked. 
And in that moment, shame creeps into the equation. And shame begins to drive now virtually everything that humankind does because they feel ashamed. So I've got, I've got three things. I need, and this is, not, this is not cute. This is not like catchy. This is not, it's three realities that we all have to wrestle with in here today because here's the problem. The problem with, with, with Christian culture oftentimes and, and the church typically is that we can, we can create a hierarchy of sins and we bring certain things into the, the conversation higher than some of the other conversations. And so we rank them accordingly and we say, well, this sin is greater. It deserves more focus and attention. Now, I understand the fact that there's certain conversations happening in politics and all that too. And so we're trying to enter those conversations. We're trying to figure out, and I'm going to talk to you in just a second about how I think we can enter these conversations, how I think we can uh, kind of work in, in, in the world, not of the world, right? But the problem is, is none of these sins are ranked any higher than any of the others. None of them, right? And, and, and what we like to do is we like to point the finger and call out the, the speck in someone else's eye when we have a massive plank in our own. And so before, listen, before you can even like think about addressing anything, doesn't matter if it's sex or anything else in someone else's life, you've got to look reflectively and introspectively into your own heart and say, okay, God, where am I, where am I wandering outside of your ways? Open my eyes to that. Reveal to me. Psalm 139. Search my heart, O oh God. So, so these three things have to be kind of our guidepost right here. The first one, we are all born with fleshly desires that are contrary to God's desire for us. This, this kind of helps us, helps to inform the conversation of, well, I think I was actually born this way. You were. You were. We were all born with a desire to depart from or divorce ourselves from, to sever from God's ways. Your desires might look different than my desires. Your misgivings, your propensities, your temptations might look different than my temptations. But we were all born with a sinful propensity. I know I've said that bef this before at the Blended Church, but I need you to recognize this. If you don't believe that we are sinful from birth, babysit or become a parent. That's it. All right? You have to teach a child how to, how to not just be self-absorbed. By nature, we are self-absorbed. We want what we want when we want it, Okay? And so we're all born with this kind of desire. So, so when we talk about same-sex attraction, okay, I want to talk about this word attraction because it becomes a word in, in, in our conversation that I don't, think we under, I don't think we're parsing it out properly, okay? Well, what we're saying is a couple of different things. We could say when it comes to attraction, we could say temptation. We could say that. We could also say desire, right? And so the question then has to become this. Okay, same-sex attraction, if we are attracted, if we desire the same sex, it's, it is the same, friends, as desiring anything that's outside of the way God established it to be, right? So there's nothing different about someone desiring to have relationship with someone of the same sex as me desiring to have relationship with someone of the opposite sex that's not my wife. Yeah. Or me looking lustfully at someone that's not my wife. Right. Hear me. Yeah. Jesus does not talk about the action. So what ends up happening in this conversation is we begin to parse out and we go, well, okay, the action of same sex uh, is, is, is wrong, right? But, but we can have the attraction. And so now we have to, li listen, the, the action of me s sleeping with every woman that I want to sleep with is, is wrong, right? Yes. What, about, what about the desire or the attraction? Is it wrong? Yes. We have to put them in the same camps, yes. especially if it is true 
that we all have desires that are outside. If this is true, if this is true, the next step is, do we have desires that are outside of this? Yes. And what do we do with those desires? This is where the conversation gets sticky. But this is where the gospel is. Thank you, Pastor Vayner. Because this is the, the root and the beginning of the gospel. Because, our, listen to me, it wasn't just our actions that have separated us from God. It's our desires. Scripture will say it over and over. It says, it says in, um, in, in, in Romans 13, 14, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the what? Desires of the sinful flesh. Jesus doesn't look at the action. He looks at our heart and our desires. The problem is, is I can't change my desires. I can't. I can't change it. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so what that means is, is that number two is my only saving grace here. Jesus died for all, for all of us. Every sin, every propensity, every bit of brokenness, every ailment, every wrong desire, Jesus died for all to make propitiation for our sins, meaning he was the replacement. And to make us right with the Father. You see, Jesus, friends, wrapped himself God wrapped himself in flesh and bore our sin, every bit of it. Whether, whether it's same-sex attraction or pornography, or listen to me, the severing of relationship and divorce, or anything, or anything outside of the sexual conversation, all of our sin he bore it on the cross. And he made the availability for a forgiveness to take place. For our, for our soul to be literally power washed. So that now, friends, Jesus, God does not see us sinful. He sees Jesus. And we are now justified before God. Meaning, we, just as if we had never sinned. Action or attraction. Either one of them. Just as if we never had. And the purposes of that was not just to forgive us. It's to move us back into a place of wholeness and integration so that we once again, listen to me, all of us once again can become who God intended us to become, whole and righteous before him. No, listen to me, no matter what your orientation is. It doesn't matter. Every one of us have to grapple with this reality of what's my sinful desires? What's warring with me, within me? How did Jesus, how did he deal with this? And then number three, we need the spirit of Christ to reign in us. Not just live in us. No, not just live in us, friends. Reign in us. That he now replaces anything that we would put on the throne of our life to determine the standard for our life. He replaces that as God. We put him in his rightful place where he reigns and he rules in our life. We need the spirit of God to reign in us so that our mind and our heart can be renewed daily. So, so, so listen, this conversation right here, the language of same-sex attraction, the language of transgender, the language of these things that we're talking about that become the in vogue conversation, it, 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 it has become branded as this, I identify as blank. I identify as blank. And I can tell you this. I identify as a sinner. Because I, I identify as someone who lusts. Someone who has been exposed to and desired pornography. I identify as someone who is broken. <laughs> I identify as someone who, who, wants to, who wants to use other people for my own gain. 
who has some really nasty, wicked thoughts. If you were to place the thoughts, some of the thoughts that I have up on this screen, it would be the most embarrassing thing that could ever happen. I identify as that. Do you think that's where the Lord wants me to identify? Why? Because, friends, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You and I were never meant to identify as anything other than a child of God. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, because of the empty tomb, we now have a seat right next to the right hand of the Father. We are co-heirs with Christ, sons and daughters. We have something in our future, friends, that is far greater than anything this world could offer us. We have something to look forward to. And so what that does, because of that, because I am not identified based on my orientation or based on who, who, what I do or based on my performance or based on anything else that I would tend to put my identity in. I'm not that anymore. And overwhelmingly out of the overflow of that, I want and desire to follow after Jesus. However, there's desires that war against that desire. So what do we do with those desires? They've, they're warring. We have to put them to death. We have, listen friends, when you focus on something, you're gonna find that and what you focus on grows. So if you focus on the spirit nature inside of you, the new man, the new woman, the new creation, if you focus on your identity being in Christ, that's gonna grow. And there's only so much room in our souls. And so when the spirit grows, the flesh can die. But if the flesh grows, the spirit will die. And it's, it, it doesn't surprise me to see how far I would go if I feed my flesh. You see, when it comes to identity across the board, as followers of Jesus, the only thing that I see scripture telling us that Jesus says about what we should identify as is as a disciple of him. But what is the definition of a disciple of him? Listen, across the board, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter your orientation, doesn't matter your attractions or desires, doesn't matter. This is, this is what it says. It says, whoever wants to be my disciple, Matthew 16, 24. He also says this in Mark, says it in Luke and all the synoptic gospels, Jesus says, who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. I don't like that. I don't like that. I've got to, I've got to deny my desires. Deny the flesh. You see, what I've learned is that when I operate in alignment with God's ways, it may not be immediately, but eventually, there's massive fulfillment there. There's healing, there's redemption. And so what I have to do is when I, don't, when I look at God's word and I don't agree, I have to say, God, I don't agree, but teach me to see as you see. Because my desires are going to war against your word. <laughs> but I want to put to death my desires. Mortify them. <laughs> Lay siege to them. Cut off the supply line. Starve those desires. When you starve those desires, friends, when you starve them, they begin to shrink and the spirit begins to live inside of you and the spirit begins to reign inside of you and the spirit begins to move inside of you. And I'm not saying that you're going to completely like eliminate your, all of your desires or your attractions. The day that we die, we will be fully glorified. We will be fully made new. But I am saying that as followers of Jesus, 
every single day, this lifelong journey, we can become more like Christ, where the spirit reigns more and more, where I become less and less. My desires, my orientation, my lusts, my selfishness, that can become less as I put it to death. And I take up my cross and I follow him daily. Now, um, I gotta say this and then we're gonna close. You need to think about this for your own life. Because what the temptation will be is, is to go, hey, Davey gave us a bunch of resources. He gave us this really good graph right here and I'm gonna go tell everybody in my life who deals with same-sex attraction. I've got kind of the argumentation right here. No, 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 no. Can I tell you something? A couple of things. We are called as believers to be in the world, not of the world, but to also accept people where they are and let the Holy Spirit do his work. You cannot be the Holy Spirit for someone. And I realize this is a very, very sensitive topic because I realize that this topic, transgender, um, LGBTQ, I, I realize it's touching every single one of us, whether it's a family member. I'll share with you this. I have a family member who, um, uh, they, they have been openly um, gay. And um, it, it, you know, trying to figure out like, what does that look like? And how do we, how do we love this person and, and accept this person? It's unbelievable. I, I've never had, as a pastor, I've never had a conversation with this person about that. And yet I've watched the Lord transform, transform this person's heart as we've just opened up our home, as we've just loved on this person, as we've just acted and, and treated this person no different. And I'm watching the Holy Spirit do a work in this person's life. My wife, Christy, has um, one of her best friends in college, uh, in, in, in graduate school, um, is a gay man. And he invited us to their wedding. How do, you, how do you wrestle with that one, right? I'm not saying this is what you should do, and I'm not saying that this is, I'm just saying this is where we wrestled through it, and we decided we went to their wedding. Um, because I can delineate loving someone and accepting someone, but not approving or agreeing with. And I want to challenge the church to be able to delineate the same thing. Because Jesus was one who, everybody who was most unlike Jesus, liked Jesus the most. He was one that looked at the woman caught in adultery. And he said, does nobody condemn you? Well, because everybody began to realize they had their own sinful desires. So they dropped their stones and they walked away. And he said, I don't condemn you either but daughter, go and sin no more. Jesus was perfectly masterful at walking that tension of truth and grace, truth and grace, truth and grace, truth and grace. And I wonder what it would look like if, if we wouldn't let the, our fear of, 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 of thinking that we're demonstrating approval or agreement for something keep us from welcoming, inviting, and loving people. When I was pastoring a church, there were, we had a lesbian couple that came re regularly. I remember seeing them at a concert with um, their group of friends and, and, you know, she holds up her, you know, her, her big massive beer and she's like, hey, it's my pastor. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, I couldn't say anything other than just like, it's good to see you guys. I love you guys, right? Like. I was so glad that I was their pastor. Because listen, as believers, we're called to operate in the nuance and in the gray and in the tension and in the weird. The second you begin to get too black and white about things in terms of your relationships with others, the second you slip into that judgmentalism. And, and, and we all need to walk away from this moment right here going, what is the sin that I'm dealing with? Where, am, where is my life outside of God's standard? Because I promise you, listen to me, don't look at anybody else. I promise you if, you, do, if you're introspective enough, you can find an area that you have replaced God on the throne of your life. And God is saying, right now, we gotta, we gotta mortify that sin. 
We've got we've to kill those desires so that you can become more like Jesus. Um, man, I know I'm, I'm usually here rallying you and getting you excited and stuff like that. I got, I got none of that. I want to talk to you as a brother, as a friend, and as someone who is truly trying to, I'm not perfect, but truly my heart's desire is to mortify the flesh inside of me. And that's my desire for you. Because then we look like the church that Jesus meant for his church to look like. And then we see transformation happen in this, in this wall, inside these walls and in this city and in this community. But it starts with us going, how do I? <laughs> How do I kill the desires inside of me? So let's do this. I wanna, I wanna stand, I wanna pray. And I don't have any kind of like crazy, you know, altar call or anything like that, but maybe you do want prayer today. Maybe you're wrestling with some of these, these questions of, you know, transitioning or same-sex attraction or, and, and, and I, want you, I want you to hear me say this, I love you. I love you enough to, to bring truth to you, but also I love you enough to put my arm around you, to walk with you and pray with you. And my heart is, is that this, enchi- this entire church loves you. Yes. Yeah. And if you're wrestling with any type of sin, <laughs> I love you. And my heart is, is that this, this church loves you and that we would wrap our arms around you and that together we would mutually join into confession, repentance, accountability, prayer, and we would experience freedom and wholeness and breakthrough. And that's not a moment that you can conjure up. That's only a moment that the Holy Spirit can intervene. And so Holy Spirit, we're asking right now that you would intervene. Would you step into this space? (laughs) Would you use a a, a feeble attempt at parsing out your ways and your mysteries and your your laws and your goodness, God? Would you would you would you use this and would it just would just seep into our hearts and may the gospel reign and rule in our hearts? It's not just for salvation, Lord. It's it's for it's for every single day. We need the gospel. We need the reality of the fact that we are sinners. We are saved by grace, but we are also changed by grace. And we wanna put our eyes on you, Jesus. We wanna take our eyes off of other people. We wanna take our eyes off of other people's misgivings or shortcomings. We wanna put our eyes on you, Jesus. (laughs) And we want that, Jesus, to inform who we are because we are yours. (laughs) We identify as your children and that's it. And anything that you wanna work out of us, anything that you wanna put in us, anything that you wanna do with us, we yield to you because we are yours. We bring everything of ours. We bring our sin, we bring our hopes, we bring our desires, we bring our dreams, we bring our selfishness, we bring our orientation, we bring it all and we submit it to you, Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith giving you all the glory and the honor and the praise. We thank you. And all of God's people said.